Hello, I'm Imeline Sienkwesi and welcome to Ambitious Conversations brought to you by Tatal. In this conversation, we will be exploring how global leaders, businesses and society can help reduce emissions and reach net zero by 2050. We'll hear from industry thought leaders about the bold actions which are being taken to meet this global goal and some of the key solutions which will help us to get there. We'll also discuss insights gleaned from CNBC Catalyst social polls in collaboration with Tatao, which were shared on Twitter and LinkedIn. Before we begin, I'm pleased to introduce our panel of experts and joining me to debate our path to carbon neutrality is Mathieu Sulas, Senior Vice President for Strategy and Climate at Tatao. Girish Nadkani, CEO of Tatao Carbon Neutrality Ventures, the venture capital arm of Tatao, which invests in startup contributing to a low carbon future. And Stéphane Germain, President and CEO of GHG Sat, whose satellites and aircraft sensors detect and measure greenhouse gases. Thank you all for joining me. Now, over the past few months, we've seen governments across the world make commitments to reduce emissions. Most recently, US President Joe Biden pledged to reduce emissions by at least 50% by 2030. The EU has committed to reach net zero by 2050, and last year China announced that it's targeting carbon neutrality by 2060. We've also seen over a thousand companies of all sizes across 60 countries set some impressive climate targets. How critical is it that we see an acceleration of global efforts to tackle climate change to reach net zero and meet the Paris Agreement goals? I'd like to come to you first, Mathieu. Is now the time for us to see an even more concerted effort? And what role does the wider energy industry play in this? Of course, the, the sooner the better. So it's, uh, it's very good to see uh, this uh, increased momentum. Uh, with more and more uh, states and countries uh, committing to reducing the emissions and going to net zero and more and more uh, private companies to do so and uh, and, and the, the double challenge indeed is that we need more energy we need to more energy to continue to develop our world to give energy to the ones who do not have it uh, today we have to change the, the way we are uh, consuming energies because we need to reduce drastically the, the carbon emission Greenhouse gas is impacting too much for the planet and, and we have to change. We as a major energy company, we are part of the solution. We of course will uh, invest and commit, help our customers to reduce their emission. So it's providing them products with less carbon content. And it's also helping them to switch to new energies, energies with zero or, or very low carbon content. Stefan, how necessary is it that we see bold actions and that the international community both commits and outlines concrete steps to reach net zero? Well, first, the science and the facts are clear. There is a growing, an acceleration, in fact, of temperature rise and concentrations of uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And the time to act is absolutely now. We do need to be bold. It's important that companies make pledges to net zero, but we also need intermediate action. We can't just wait and set ourselves a long-term goal and not have anything intermediate paces us towards achieving those goals. There are many things that we can do now in the short term, in some cases, profitable changes that can be made to operations across multiple industries that can reduce greenhouse gas emissions and have a short-term impact on climate change. And I think we need to be bold about that. We need to take those steps now. Girish, do you agree that we need to see greater ambition globally when it comes to reaching net zero? You know, not only do I agree, but we should have at least started a few years ago. Uh, the longer we wait, the more difficult the task becomes and, and the closer we become to the edge. So absolutely, we, we need to be there and we need to be a lot more aggressive. And, and, and as Matthew and, and Stefan have pointed out, we are taking a lot of action, a lot of companies, governments, regulatory authorities are talking about it and, and addressing it. So this is exactly the right time for everything to come together. Now, when we think about climate change and the gases which contribute to it, carbon dioxide is perhaps the most widely known, but methane's global warming potential is 25 times greater than carbon dioxide. According to our poll, 54% of those who participated recognize it's the second most abundant greenhouse gas. Stefan, your company's primary focus is detecting and measuring methane emissions. Is enough attention being given to minimizing levels of methane globally? And what needs to change? 
So there's certainly growing attention. And I was very pleased actually to see that the poll said that half of the people recognized that uh, methane was important, but there's still a long way to go. Uh, it is a very difficult challenge for industrial operators across many industries, including oil and gas, to find their emissions and properly understand their emissions across all their facilities. There's a lot of reasons for that, uh, probably starting with the fact that 50% of methane emissions are fugitive, in this, and that means that they're not planned. They're not things that would be deliberate or understood necessarily. They can be a result of breaks or unplanned events. And so finding those leaks and finding them quickly anywhere in the world is imperative. That's, that's what needs to happen now. Now, the good news is that the technology is there now. For the first time, we can actually measure the entire planet now using satellites, and not just one set of satellites, but many sets of satellites that have complementary capabilities. And then they can be used to find large leaks that then guide investment priorities and teams on the ground to go repair those emissions. And again, it's really good news that a lot of those problems are relatively easy to fix. For example, one of the largest sources we've seen in the world are from unlit flares. So from venting of methane from facilities that could otherwise be burning the methane to convert it to carbon dioxide and, ha and have less of a short-term impact than the environment. But it's finding those and then changing the policies and the approaches of the companies that are venting um, to uh, really fix that one major problem early on that make a huge difference. The source where we find 45% of all the emissions we've measured worldwide is from coal mining. The couple of countries in the world are emitting a tremendous amount of methane, and that methane can be captured in ways where the technology exists today to capture that methane and use it to generate electricity at those mines or for local towns and villages. It's existing technology, existing solutions across many industries. Mathieu, is methane reduction a priority for Tatao and how are you tackling it? It is clearly a priority to reduce the methane emissions. A natural gas has a key role to play in the energy transition. It emits twice less CO2 than coal for power generation and it complements very well the renewable power production. It's very important that this natural gas supply chain must be perfectly managed. And with all efforts to detect measure and eliminate all possible methane leaks on all the assets of the industry. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, technically, it's, uh, it starts to be feasible, like explained by Stefan with satellite technology, but it's, we need still to, to, to invest, to finalize the development of a technology, and then to, uh, to develop it at scale on, on all the supply chain. And the second thing is, of course, it's good to do it for ourselves, but we need to, to do it for the whole industry so that the whole world uh, manage and, and decrease drastically the methane emissions. Girish, you invest in startups whose innovations are helping us reach net zero. It's not just about investing in solutions to reduce methane emissions from the industrial sector, is it? In as much as the attention is appropriately and rightly on oil and gas companies for their contribution to methane emission, I think let's, we should also not lose sight of the fact that many industries and, and activities generate methane as well whether it's garbage dumps and one surprising source to many is, is, is animals and mostly beef. So as our prosperity grows and as people eat more and more beef and there is more and more raising of, of dairy, etc., the, the flatulence from the cows uh, contributes at least 8% of methane. And so a number of areas we're looking at ranging from perhaps feeding seaweed or other foods to the cows so that they can reduce their methane uh, flatulence to plant-based meats so people don't actually have to eat meats. Uh, or we have recently invested in a company called Deep Branch where it converts carbon dioxide to single cell proteins which can then be converted to uh, meat products, etc. So there are multiple processes and, and methods of addressing the methane issue from tracking it, trapping it or just changing it. When it comes to solutions and technologies businesses are prioritizing to reduce their emissions, our social poll shows the majority at 53% are focusing on the use of renewable energy. Mathieu, how much progress is being made when it comes to the types and competitiveness of renewable energy? Indeed, the, uh, the development of renewable energy is key. From sustainable biofuel or solar and wind power, 
which are more visible. What is in interesting and very important is that for power generation, um, the costs of those technologies are decreasing very fast. So that those uh, way of producing electricity, solar and wind, are now economical in, a, in many parts of the world. So what is important is to be able to invest at scale, and it's uh, what does the, uh, the total group, to develop those capacities, to enlarge the geographical footprint, because we need to supply in, in clean energy the whole planet. And, and we need also to work on the usage, because we need to develop the usage of electricity, replacing burning fossil fuels, for example, and, and coal in particular. It's part of a strategy of a company like us, delivering energy to customers. Uh, we, we need to help the customer switching their uh, thermal vehicle, for example, to an electric vehicle. We need to make this change smooth so that the customer can recharge when he needs. So we need to foster those infrastructure to make sure that the, uh, the, the energy transition for everyone uh, is, is smooth and easy. Girish, 21% of those who voted in our poll are prioritizing carbon capture solutions. Are you surprised by this and how significant are developments in carbon capture technologies? Let me start by addressing a little bit of what Matthew said and I'll come back to your question. Uh, clearly, wind and solar are a critical part of what we need to do. Uh, electrification will drive a large part of reduction of the greenhouse gases. Uh, but there are a few challenges to that. Uh, first and foremost, renewables are intermittent. We can't have them on all the time, so we have to adjust for that. Secondly, to the extent that our energy needs are constantly increasing, there just isn't enough land space available to have enough solar or enough wind to supply all our needs. As a result of which, we are going to have to explore other sources of energy, whether it's geothermal or at some point, we're just going to have to grin hard and address the nuclear question and say, do we need to go back to nuclear? And I understand there are all kinds of arguments on both sides of it, but it's just a question we have to address head on. And, and finally, I will say, in as much as we're trying to electrify a lot of things, there are certain parts of industry which need such a high level of temperature, whether it's steel or cement or chemicals, that today there isn't any resistance material which can generate that level of heat required. And so if we don't want to rely on fossil fuels, we are going to have to rely on things like hydrogen to get to that level of, of temperature. So we have to explore other forms of uh, generating energy. Now, to coming back to your question on carbon capture, uh, at, a, at a sort of an intuitive level, it's, a, it's like you know, motherhood and apple pie. If carbon is creating a problem, why not capture carbon? Uh, the problem is today technologies exist, whether it's capturing it at source, which we call point source, or, or sucking it directly from the air. Uh, the challenge becomes from direct air capture perspective, it's very expensive today, and we hope over time it will go down. The other problem is once you capture it, what do you do with it? Do you reuse it? Do you store it? Do you mineralize it? So those challenges are, are also being addressed, uh, but clearly carbon capture is critical. Stefan, now when we think about digital technologies and the efficiencies they can provide, only 14% of poll voters are prioritizing in this area. In what way is artificial intelligence so valuable on a global level? I'm not surprised by the poll results because digital technologies tend to be a bit more intangible than some of the more immediately tangible, impressionable solutions that are listed, particularly renewable energy. But there are tremendous advantages to be gained from digital technology. And industries have been harnessing digital technology for performance and process efficiencies for years now. In the world of my company, we believe that we can use artificial intelligence, and we are using artificial intelligence to help find greenhouse gas leaks everywhere in the world. It's a huge job to be monitoring the whole planet every day for methane leaks and carbon dioxide leaks. You need the efficiencies that can be brought from algorithms, from uh, machines to help sift through all that data to look for these telltale signs of emissions. And it, sometimes the bigger ones are obvious, they don't happen quite as often and they're easier to see, but it's really the little ones that are very hard to track. So in the same ways you can use digital technology with process efficiencies to help improve energy efficiency, not just in businesses, but also in homes, for example, and in industrial buildings. You can also use digital technologies and artificial intelligence to help 
to improve the performance of our supply chain of energy. So from the well to the consumer of natural gas, for example, to help find all the leaks that are along that chain to make that supply chain as uh, seamless as possible. When we think about tackling climate change, it's also important to consider the barriers to implementing changes. The fight against climate change is everyone's business, but according to our poll, cost is the biggest factor with close to half of respondents at 43%, saying it limits them from being more sustainable, followed by infrastructure at 31%. Mathieu, what's key to overcoming these limitations in relation to infrastructure and cost? It's true that uh, the, the cost is, is a real subject uh, because to get affordable energy is, is key to everyone and we need energy. Affordable energy is something we have already with, uh, with fossil fuels because fossil fuels are, are relatively cheap to produce and because we have already built all the, the infrastructure to, to, to produce it and, and to consume it. To go to the uh, low carbon energy mix, indeed, we need to invest and uh, we have the technologies, but we need the willingness of everyone to change and to invest and to build the infrastructures that we still do not have in this uh, renewable green energy world. Private company can do a lot from supporting research and development in low carbon technologies. Private company can also invest to uh, to implement those technologies at, at scale. Solar farm, for example, also the, the offshore windmills, it, it is costing a lot, it requires a lot of investment. And, um, and to, to foster that, to, to trigger that, uh, in many places we need the, uh, the proper and well-defined uh, public policies, like having an efficient carbon price system, such as the one existing already in Europe and specifically in the UK. It really triggers the change. It's a real uh, virtuous circle when the, the policy comes first and, uh, and, and the private company were already ready to invest and we see those investments growing and growing and uh, renewable power generation, for example, becoming green at scale. We need to build this environment, this global framework and, and to build the, uh, the virtuous circle. Stefan, what are the cost and financing dynamics when we think of technology associated with reducing methane emissions more specifically? Well, without getting into too much detail, there's the, as we've already alluded to, there, there are different kinds of costs. There are the costs that um, you, are there are expenses that we pay per unit energy for you know what we get on our heating bill at home for heating our house. Then there are costs for externalities, for example, where if you now have to pay extra because carbon is being taxed in your jurisdiction, then there's also capital costs. And what we found in a lot of the places we monitor methane is that it's the capital cost that's actually the bigger issue. The capital cost, for example, of um, repairing a landfill gas problem. If you can put a gas recovery system in place and capture that gas and use it to either power uh, a gas grid in the city or provide electricity for an electricity grid in the city, that's very attractive, but you have to have the capital to put the gas recovery system in place in the first place. And it applies to different companies, different jurisdictions in different ways. But um, certainly some of the largest emission sources in the world we've seen are places where clearly there's a reluctance to make that initial capital investment. So some of that can be fixed via externalities. Some of that can be fixed by international investment. Uh, but clearly in many of these cases, an obvious return on investment. You'll actually make money in the short term by making that capital investment upfront and gaining more revenues from, from saving the gas. How can we overcome these challenges? I don't want to get too philosophical, but I personally am a big believer in the power of markets. So if we can put an appropriate price on the externality of carbon, if we can actually differentiate commodity pricing by the carbon intensity of that commodity. So for example, if you can take an ingot of aluminum that was created using coal and price it differently than an ingot of aluminum that was created using hydropower. And the market will actually pay a different price for that. Ultimately, the market and the buyers that want to pay and will actually determine the premium that they'll pay for that low carbon commodity will drive the right behavior in businesses all along the chain that are delivering those commodities. So I fundamentally believe that that mechanism will happen. I I think it's a horribly complicated process if you rely on global carbon pricing or global carbon taxes to do that. 
I really believe there has to be a more efficient market mechanism by which to get there than that. Government will have a role, absolutely, because government sets the watermark for everybody to work to. In Europe, for example, there's a very interesting debate that I think is going to become reality sooner rather than later with regards to the carbon border taxes. And I think that also will drive um, significant behavior changes in many places of the world that are supplying into Europe. So these are all things that governments must act to drive that change. But ultimately, I'm a firm believer that the market will dictate the differences between the products and ultimately the behaviors of companies. Interestingly, only 13% say that identifying the tools prevents them from reducing emissions. So Girish, as a venture capital investor, do you think we have enough new technologies? Well, we have enough technology today, but in terms of technologies, we have two issues today. One is the behavioral side. There's plenty of technology for, for energy efficiency, for home improvements and other things. The second, from an industrial technology perspective, we have in clean tech investing what is known as the value of death problem, where a certain technology, be it using algae to convert to biofuels or a new solar PV cell or, or a new wind turbine, for that to become commercially acceptable and viable, and as we say, bankable, it has to go through a proof of concept at an industrial scale. And that requires a pretty significant amount of capital, sometimes 50 million, sometimes 100 million. And so that has become very difficult. And a lot of technologies are kind of stuck at the value of debt problem. And if we can solve that, it will help a lot. I can only agree with Girish. We need, uh, we need a new uh, solution. And in the energy transition, we see we have so many problems, so many uh, possible solutions. We just need to improve the existing solution to reduce their cost. Uh, but we are still we still have some fields where the solutions are, are not efficient enough. And when you speak about uh, long distance traveling, for example, being shipping, aviation, hydrogen could be a solution. It's still very expensive. So we need more R&D effort, more technology to decrease the cost of possible other fuels. When you speak about industry, still a plant or a cement producing plant is for the moment emitting a lot of CO2. We do not have yet the technologies which are very efficient to reduce those emissions. So we will put some CCUS that we discussed earlier to decrease rapidly the emissions of those industries, but we need to develop the new processes, the new way of producing cement or building uh, uh, homes and, 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 and houses. It's a driver in life to be creative, to innovate, uh, to find new solutions, but and, and for sure on the low carbon energy side, we still have lots of things to find and, um, and to develop. Now, our final poll question aimed to establish how optimistic our social media audience are when it comes to the world being able to meet net zero 2050 targets. Only 18% are very optimistic will reach it, with the majority at 49% saying they're not. I'd be really interested to hear your perspectives on this. Stefan, what is it going to take to reach net zero by 2050? Well, first, I'm an optimist by nature, so I, I'm disappointed to see that the majority were not optimistic. As we've heard through the discussion today, there are lots of solutions that can be brought to bear. That being said, I'm moderately optimistic, and I think we need to keep working really hard to achieve those targets and achieve our goals. I think we need to push as hard as we can towards the Paris Agreement goals. Net zero pledges by 2050 are very important. But as I said before, I think it's absolutely critical, even more important that we have intermediate steps and intermediate goals with very clear, concrete actions along the way. So that starts with measuring, understanding emissions, controlling them, and systematically reducing them across the entire enterprise, across multiple industries. That can be done today. The technology is there, it exists. And then the technologies to control and reduce emissions also exist and in many cases can be done profitably. I think we, all, we absolutely need to keep innovating. There's enormous global scale challenges that need to be addressed now, but I, I am reasonably optimistic that we can do that if enough concerted energy is uh, put forward by everybody to do it. Mathieu, are you surprised by our poll findings? In your view, what will be key to achieving net zero? Yes, the figures are speaking by themselves, and uh, but at least it shows uh, that the, the challenge of the energy transition is, is not underestimated. 
and uh, and it is important because it's uh, it's indeed a, 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 a huge challenge. It's a, a transformation of the world where we're living. For everybody, it's a bit scary when you think about all what we have to do. But the fact are that we have no choice. Uh, we have just only one planet. And the second point is that we are not alone. And, uh, and it's clearly a, a collective effort. Each of us, we have a role to play. And of course, the politicians have a lot to do to put in place the frameworks, to, to show the direction. Private company or companies in general have to invest and shift their business models, especially in terms of energy, uh, supplying energy, which is greener and greener. But each of us, we have to take part in this transformation. There's many examples of things that we can do, um, changing our habits, um, making sure that we are aware of the challenge. And we have to see the positive side of it because this energy more and more uh, will, be, uh, will be local energy. And, uh, and it's also creating new jobs. The figures show that the, the challenge is big. We need to explain it and we need to be able to, to face it collectively. So we are very optimistic, yes. Girish, what's your view and is pressure mounting on the international community to do more? Uh, very much so. I, I think for the first time ever, we have all the people in the lifeboat pulling in the same direction. What do I mean by that? People and consumers are increasingly aware of this and they're demanding from their companies and the products they buy that they be green. People are even willing to pay a green premium in some cases. Companies are increasingly declaring their net zero targets. Governments are stepping up in terms of whether it's regulatory policy issues and support systems, etc. Wall Street and investors like BlackRock are now starting to put pressure on companies to declare what their green strategies are. SEC and, uh, and the Fed and the European Investment Bank, etc., are now starting to declare that climate change is a critical risk factor which companies need to declare. So the escape valves or the escape routes are being blocked and you have no choice and the noose is tightening, if you will. And so when all people start rowing in the, in the same direction, albeit, albeit at different speeds, I think significant progress will be made. Well, that's all we've got time for, but I'd like to thank my guests. Mathieu Soulas, Senior Vice President for Strategy and Climate at Tatao. Girish Nadkani, CEO of Tatao Carbon Neutrality Ventures, and Stéphane Germain, President and CEO of GHG Sat. Thank you for watching what has been an insightful conversation on the actions and solutions which will help us reach carbon neutrality by 2050. Goodbye for now.